LinkedIn News. From the news team at LinkedIn, I'm Jesse Hempel, and this is Hello Monday. Now, when I was at the beginning of my career, long time ago now, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a writer, and I wanted to write specifically for magazines. I was lucky that way, to have that certainty. But also, for a lot of us, that's just how the beginnings of our careers often work. We start out with a big goal, and then sometime in the middle, for many people, including me, things change. Maybe you make partner, land the big title, and ask, well, what now? Or maybe somewhere along the way, you just lose interest in the path. Say, there's a global pandemic, and it shifts all of your priorities. At some point, you look up, and it's time to do something new. But then you have to ask yourself, okay, but what? Today, I'm talking to my friend Fran Hauser about that question. I first met Fran when we both worked for Time Inc. Her job was to help titles like People Magazine build their digital presence. And she was great at it. But her job kept expanding and she kept growing as a person until one day it just didn't light her up in the same way. And so Fran orchestrated a change. Today, Fran's an angel investor. She invests in women-owned companies. And all of these years of talking to women, along with that personal experience of her own, made her somewhat of an expert on careers. For so many people, Fran's that person you call when you're just at a crossroads. Now she's translated that wisdom into a workbook. It's called Embrace the Work, Love Your Career. And we're going to unpack a lot of that advice. Fran and I started our conversation by talking about the point of it all. Here's Fran. Feeling like what you're doing matters. Feeling that you're making an impact And I do think that joy is a part of that, but I don't think it's all of it. You know, I think it's, it's bigger than that. And I I think that's like the best word that I could come up with in terms of how, you know, when I think about the best career experiences that I've had, it's that feeling of just really being fulfilled in, in the work that I'm doing and the people that I'm working with. Yeah. Well, what's interesting to me is how that equation can work for a long time for someone and then stop working. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your own experience in media. I mean, when you got to eight years at Time Inc., my guess is that for a good portion of that time, it fulfilled you. Maybe I'm wrong, but maybe you could talk a little bit about what changed. Yeah, it did. It's a great question. I found so much of my tenure there very fulfilling because I was mostly in build mode and, you know, creating and launching new digital products, mostly for the women's magazines, People in Style, Entertainment Weekly, Real Simple. And we should say, and this was a time when the magazine brands that you're working for were very much in the center of conversation, right? This is this is a time when Time Inc. was a word that anybody that you met in any place in the United States or probably around the world would know. Right. Those brands were so relevant at that time to the point where, you know, in the beginning, it was it was hard to convince the print side of the business yeah. to even care about digital, right? The brands were relevant. It was so much fun because I really got to work on innovation. I got to work on, you know, what are the extensions of these brands digitally? How can we connect with consumers in different ways? I loved the education part of my job, what digital could do for our business. So it was so rewarding and so fulfilling. And One thing that happened was my job got a lot broader where I started taking on more and more and more and more brands. I had 20 brands at one point. Remember, I started with People Magazine. And Fran, is that about the change of an industry or is that about Mm -hmm. gaining seniority? Is that the price that you pay when you climb up the career ladder in any industry? Well, for me, it was both. There was definitely a seniority thing for me because of course I wanted more responsibility and of course I wanted more power and more money and everything that comes with that. That was all really appealing. But what I didn't realize was that it wasn't going to be as much fun. It wasn't as fulfilling. Going back to the word fulfilling, I felt like I was doing more like paper pushing than really like rolling up my sleeves and and building something that consumers really cared about. So that was, that was something that was really surprising to me, you know, because I'd been working my whole career with the idea of just taking on more and more and more and more responsibility, but then I didn't enjoy it as much. So there's another piece to this, Fran, which is that in the more traditional way that our parents built their careers, when you would enter an industry, and if you were lucky enough, a 
company. The path forward, the way that you should progress and attain seniority and make more money was prescribed for you. And your job was to take the next step up the ladder. But in the career world that we live in today, it doesn't work like that at all. And in fact, you really can't rely on your company or your industry to show you that path. And I think what you're describing too, when you describe being eight years into your role and looking up and feeling dissatisfied, is hitting that point when you realize it's time to stop looking to somebody else to tell you what to do. You're going to have to figure out what to do. That is where your tool book comes in. So how mm. do we do that? Mm. I love that. And I do like the the one distinction I would make is that I I feel very fortunate that I do have a wonderful support team and network that I can ask questions of and they'll give me some input, right? And I'm going to take that input. But at the end of the day, I have to figure it out. What I see a lot of is we're in this autopilot mode and we don't take the time to take a step back and reflect and and reset. The metaphor I like to use for the book is you know how you'll do a food cleanse like you'll take like the 5 days or the 7 days and you schedule it out and you 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 go through the whole process, right? Right. I feel like the book is very similar to that, you know? It's six <laughs> sections. Give yourself like one section a day, set aside the time to do the work, and I really do think that you'll come out of it with a vision and 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 a plan right? Because the plan is a really important part of it too. It's not just the vision, but like, how are you going to execute on it? So one of your exercises, uh, which you mentioned earlier, has to do with looking back at your calendar and just circling the things that you can remember that brought you energy. Tell us a little bit more about things that we might be starting to think about or to do. It's really important to think about like, what are the things about your role that you dread? Like, what what are the things that you start worrying about on Sunday? And really kind of like making a list of of those things. Because a lot of this, Jesse, is about how can you take the initiative to have a conversation with your manager where you can talk about like, here are the things that I really enjoy doing and I'm really good at. I think I can really add some value there. And then here are the things that are quite, they're not quite working. Because the idea is like, it's not to leave your job, right? Like if you could stay in your job and just make it better and do more of what's working for you, ultimately that's going to be better for the company too. Right. So I think doing this kind of, you know, this, this reflection, and then also thinking about another big part of feeling fulfilled is, are you being appropriately valued for the work that you're doing? And that can be monetary and non-monetary. You know, do you feel like you're getting the recognition? Do you feel like you're getting put on, you know, the highly visible projects, the ones that, you know, everyone's talking about? So let's unpack that one a little bit because yeah. because I, I even feel my own chest seize up a little bit when you ask the question, are you being properly valued? Because it, it sort of runs into, I think, a number of uh, gender-influenced thoughts I have about what it even means to be valued or valuable in an organization. How do I begin to objectively answer that question for myself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe it is so important to be having conversations with people outside of the company that you work at to try to get some market intelligence around what other people, what your peers, you know, at, at other companies, what their compensation, total compensation range is. And, you know, I remember even when I was at Time Inc., I would meet with executive recruiters often just for coffee and ask them these questions. I remember meeting with peers at other media companies and we would share that information with each other. Think about the power that that gives you, right? Like information is power. Right. So not being afraid to talk about it with others, I do believe is really important. And I literally just had this experience with someone who was working at a company, only been there for six months, but her boss got let go. And then the boss's boss left. So all of the work fell on her. And she was doing such an incredible job. And I really encouraged her, it was the end of the year, to ask for more money. Mm -hmm. And she was so hesitant. She waited. She waited a while. Like she was really nervous about doing it. But do you know that she asked and she ended up getting a 50%, 50% raise. 50%, yeah. And I can give you like 20 other stories like this. I mean, I, I literally can. Like, what's the worst thing that can happen? You get a no, right? And and maybe you can negotiate something else that's not financially related, but something else that can make your job 
feel better for you. Oh, but Fran, I think it ties into likability. I think that people are sometimes afraid to ask because they're not sure if they quote unquote deserve, which that's a scary word. And so they think, well, okay, even if they say no to me, I can live with the no, but I don't know if I can live with the fact that maybe they will think less of me because I asked. Mm -hmm. They won't like me anymore because I asked. They'll think that I'm arrogant. How do you address that? Yeah. And I think that is common. And I can tell you as a leader, when I look back on the 20 years that I spent in corporate, it was mostly men that came to me, men on my team that asked me for raises. It was, I think I had, I'm not kidding. I think I had three women over the course of my whole entire career that asked me for a raise. I think it's about, you know, the way that you have the conversation. I think if it comes from a place of Having the market intelligence, I think is really important showing that you've done the work to really understand what other people at other companies in similar roles are making and talking about like, if there is an extenuating circumstance, like this woman who took on all this work because the boss and the boss's boss, like talking about that, talking about like, how have you created value for the company and doing it in such a positive way, talking about how much you love working for the company. I think about how different people have approached me over the years. And I feel like when people have approached me from a more like in a more defensive and almost angry way, that's a really hard conversation to have, always, right? But if it's someone who's like sitting in my office, smiling, telling me how much she loves her job and how much she loves this company, and then talking to me about what she believes she's worth, like I, I actually think more highly of that person because I think that, you know, they're being conscientious, they're being thoughtful about the way that they're approaching me. They're confident, yeah. but they're not being arrogant right? So much of it is about the nonverbal. We know this. I want to underscore something that I hear you saying, which is that we tell people what we're worth. So when you tell me, even if I have to say no to you, when you tell me, I believe I'm worth this much, I'm going to walk away from that conversation believing that you're worth that much. Absolutely. And if I can't do something for you right now, trust me, when it comes to end of year, the performance reviews, I'm going to remember like, oh, I had that conversation with Jesse. I know what her expectations are. Like, is there a way that I can take a little, you know, you get that pool at the end of the year where you have to like figure out the raises. Is there a way that I can take, you know, a little bit more and give it to Jesse? Because I know what her expectations are. Right. And they're valid. We'll be right back. After the break, Fran tells us how she changed careers. And we're back. Fran successfully switched careers. She switched industries, moving from media to angel investing. And there's a lot to learn from how she orchestrated this shift because it didn't happen overnight. My change was, it was interesting because basically once I decided that I wanted to explore startup investing and advising, I didn't just quit and say, okay, I'm going to go do that. I ended up taking it on. I, I did it as more of a side hustle for a couple of years. I thought, you know what, let me just try it and like see how it feels. And I started talking to people in tech that I knew, whether they were founders or venture capitalists, just people that I had kind of, you know, met through the work that I was doing at Time Inc. And I started putting it out there. I just started putting it out into the universe. Like, you know, I'm starting to look at companies with the idea of potentially investing. I was also really interested. I'll never forget learning that women were only getting, you know, at that point, 2% of venture capital dollars were going towards female founders. So that's something that I became really excited about changing the ratio there. You start this as a side hustle, Fran. Side hustle. How do you figure out that you have the stamina and the potential for the potential to be successful? Because the thing is with angel investing, it's not like you know right away. Some of these companies are going to take a long time to grow into whatever they become. Like, what makes you brave enough to feel like you're capable of stepping out and into this? I think, to be honest, a big part of the courage for me came from the fact that my kids were three years old and 18 months old at the time. And I have to tell you, Jesse, I just wasn't seeing them enough and I wanted to see them more. I wanted to be, you know, you know, my story, I adopted both of my kids at birth. My husband and I adopted them and we worked so hard to have a family. And I kind of like took a step back and I just was thinking we worked so hard to have this family, but I'm 
only really seeing them late at night during the week and then on weekends because my job was so demanding. So I knew that I, I, I really wanted to make a change for my family. And I, I, wanted, I wanted a career that was going to, to give me a lot more flexibility. And I really felt like investing and advising was, was my best shot at it because I had the network and because I really enjoyed it. You know, like I, I actually enjoyed, I enjoyed meeting with founders, helping them solve problems. Even if eventually the company, you know, ended up failing, I was enjoying the process. Yeah. So that for me was a really big part of it. I really want to tease out the combination of influences that went into the career path that you chose. You chose something that you loved and also something that enabled you to have the larger life that you loved. And you probably couldn't have made either of those decisions in isolation. They needed to be paired. And I think a lot of us are trying to think about our careers in that way. How do I get to have both? The other big part of this that I was really struggling with in making this decision is when you talk about bravery. I was really scared to go out on my own because having the Time Inc. gravitas, you know, and the fact that I could pick up the phone and call anybody and get a call back. Like really, that's how I felt at that time. And I was going to leave all of that behind. That really, really frightened me. The idea of like, would I be relevant if I went out on my own? You know, could I carry it on my own? And I think that's also why it took me two years to really leave. It took me two years, right? I did that side hustle for two years. So I just, I want to, I really want to acknowledge that it's not an easy decision. You know, the way that I'm talking about it, it might seem like it was an easy decision. It wasn't at all. Fran's workbook focuses on tools for reflection. Reflection is so critical because we have more choices than we have ever had. You know, you used to pick one thing to do. Maybe you changed jobs, but those jobs were still fairly prescribed, defined. Now we can create our own jobs or stitch together several identities. And it all sounds great, but we have to be disciplined about how we approach this. Or we'll be stuck on the hamster wheel of life running faster and faster in place. I feel like there's so much more of this kind of multi-hyphenate, you know, approach. And I I think it's okay to be more than one thing. You know, I'm an investor, I'm an author, I'm a speaker, right? Like there are different parts of my career. And I think even if you're working for a company, you could still be doing other things. I feel like sometimes we're so black and white, either or, but Maybe the answer is you stay where you are. You really try to focus more on the parts of the job that are really fueling you and you take on something else. Maybe the things that you love most can be hobbies. They don't necessarily need to grow into revenue streams as well. Or maybe if you are capable, you can take a step back and step forward again. Like we have so much more wiggle room than I think our parents did when they were at this point in their careers and navigating their careers. You do talk to just a a ton of young people and young women, people who are early in their careers. Um, What are you hearing people ask most? What do they need? Yeah, I think, so one of the things that I'm hearing a lot of from younger people is they just really miss the in-person, the socialization. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Remote is really hard for them. It feels very isolating. And I do see that as a difference between like younger employees versus sort of my peers. Mm -hmm. A lot of my peers are actually really loving the fact that they can work from home. It's giving them more flexibility. They're not missing the the kind of the socialization as much. So that's a big thing. I think they're also struggling with, especially if it's like their first job, how do I develop relationships? Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit harder because you have to be more proactive about like, you're not going to run into the person in the office. So being proactive, reaching out, asking if the person wants to go for a walk or, you know, grab a coffee. So being very intentional about that. It's so important to build these relationships. And it's hard to do that when you're on a group Zoom. Yeah, that is really true. I do think that there are really amazing ways to do this digitally. In fact, we just did an exercise with my team this week where we were divided into groups of four and there were three people in the organization I don't even know. Two of the three of them are brand new. It was great and spontaneous and intimate in the way that I feel like an in-person lunch would have been a couple years ago. But the thing about those events is that you have to plan for them. They don't just happen. Yeah, you do. A lot of it is, it goes back to intentionality. Mindfulness is a big part of the book too. You know, it's, there's a whole section on just how important 
it is to feel connected with yourself, you know, because when you're connected with yourself, then it allows you to really be more present for others and to react to situations in a way that you can feel good about. So for me, even just building in a couple of like practices, mindfulness practices a day, I know myself, they have to be like short and they have to be, you know, very easily integrated into the day. You know, like the one thing I do do every morning is I just, I take a couple of minutes and I have my little morning ritual, even before I look at my phone, where I just do a little bit of gratitude and a little bit of just sort of like a one or two minute guided meditation. It's hard to do the reflection work if you don't have the mindfulness piece. That was Fran Hauser. Her latest book is Embrace Your Work, Love Your Career. You can find it wherever books are sold. And this week on Office Hours, we're going to talk about career goals and what to do when they change. Join us for Office Hours on Wednesday afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern. You can find us on the LinkedIn news page or email us for a link at hellomonday at linkedin.com. And as always, if you like the show, please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen. Hello Monday is a production of LinkedIn. The show is produced by Taisha Henry with help from Wesley Wingo. Joe DeGiorgi mixed our show. Florence Iriando is head of original audio and video. Dave Pond is our technical director. Michaela Greer and Victoria Taylor embrace the work. Our music was composed just for us by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. Dan Roth is the editor-in-chief of LinkedIn. And Sarah Storm remains forever our fairy godmother. I'm Jesse Hempel. See you next Monday. Thanks for listening. I also saw the book at the beginning of the pandemic, and it's a memoir, and it's called The Family Outing. I, I don't know how you did that. I really don't. That's, oh my God, because it's another baby. Thank a you. book is another baby. I would say, I would say, don't write a book and have a baby in the same year. Like, if you have to do it, one can do it, but like, not <laughs> a good idea.